Welcome and good morning. We know it's Friday for this time of the day. Thankfully, uh, it's the third in our series, mini series on risk management. And today, a particular focus is on immediate action. Um, that's what I'd also like to say is, it, is acknowledge that we're on Gadigal and Digital land. What we've got here is we're back in the outdoor classroom, which is a passive solar design by Terry Bay, an architect, and it's full of all sorts of features. So if you're listening to this as the recording, um, we do do two of this. And once, once things start to reveal a bit more, feel free to hook in. Julian, sorry to interrupt, but your sound is very low. It's very soft. We can't sorry really... about that. I'll whisper more in Steve's ear. Is that better? <laughs> That is, yes. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll actually hand straight over to Steve now. <laughs> we don't get to snuggle anymore. Um, yeah, hi, welcome everyone. Um, so yeah, pest management part three today. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we'll be focusing in on some of the things that you can do right away to, to get um, to start managing pests. First, I thought it'd be really interesting um, for you guys and really good for your brains and to remember things. Let's go right back to the first um, first session we did on building soil. Uh, what can, we, we focused on two key processes for building healthy soil. Um, can anyone remember what they are? Diversity. Yes, thank you. Good. Yes, <laughs> is is kind of one. So diversity in in another is a bit more context. But yes, definitely diversity. The two key drivers for building soil. Um, Plenty of organic matter. Yeah. Yep. So that's one of them. So adding organic matter. So it might be compost. It might be mulch onto the top. So having that organic matter and that feeds the decomposing organisms that that um, turn that organic matter into into humus, which is great for your plants. And there was another mechanism as well that was really important for building soil. It's something to do with the bacteria or something. Yes. I wasn't here for the first one, but I'm wondering if it was um, not disturbing the soil too much. Yes, that's definitely one of the things that you do that helps facilitate this process. So yeah, it's a it's a not disturbing the soil is absolutely key, um, and bacteria is absolutely key. It's interesting because it's not it's it's not a commonly thought of thing. It's something new to me as well in the last six months or so. This process, it's not, that, taught. It's not taught. You're taught to cultivate. Yeah. Yeah. But there's another process going on that actually builds soil. And it's got to do with bacteria. It's got to do with diversity. And it's actually going once, going twice. It's actually, um, yes. So what, what, how do plants help? Uh, planting legumes, which draw the nutrients, sorry, the nitrogen down to the soil and thus enriching the soil yeah or yeah, so keeping it planted all the time not leaving it fallow is that what you're talking about yeah yep that was yep. From the so, video last night <laughs> ah okay this the frogs one Screaming frogs. Screaming. yeah <laughs> yeah so that's that's the other mechanism so um the plants capturing the sun's energy, photosynthesizing, making sugars, carb, basically capturing carbon out of the atmosphere, sending it down into their roots and exuding that carbon in, well, into the soil. And that feeds all the microorganisms, so bacteria, fungi, and all, all sorts of other things in the soil. Um, and it fixes carbon into the soil. And that, um, that's how you build a healthy soil ecosystem. And then those organisms, the, the bacteria and the fungi, actually go and mine minerals out of the soil and they feed the plants. So it's a two-way street. So there's this carbon flow into the soil and then all the organisms then feed the plants in return. Um, so that's a really important part of having healthy plants is actually having plants 
and the more diversity of those plants, the better. Um, the reason I mentioned that is because that, you know, that is probably one of the key things, or that is the key thing. Those two processes of building healthy soil, building a healthy soil ecosystem. If you do that well, and those of you who who engage with the singing frogs thing, um, if you do that well, your plant you you generally won't have pest issues. So this kind of strategies that you can do right at the beginning, the building blocks of your garden that can almost design almost negate the need for even thinking about pest management so we'll just put that out there for now but then we'll explore the process underneath that um so any questions about that no but it's amazing thank you <laughs> it is amazing it's incredible it's um and when you see you know it, it's a it's a message that i see time and time again every time i sort of go online and look at different people doing um doing this sort of stuff and taking this approach the same message we don't have to worry about pests we don't have to worry about pests we don't have to worry about pests so we can get you there but let's have a look at Barb's. Yep. For instance, when you have plants that the molds around them here and then another one meter away, or do you mean it really quickly? I think the principle is as much as possible. So if you can have as many plants photosynthesizing um, as much as possible. So you know, tall plants, short plants, if you can get hundred percent coverage with plants, then the more carbon, the more carbon is flowing into the soil and feeding the soil ecosystem. So we think you know. We often think the soil feeds the plants, but it's almost completely the opposite, which is an interesting sort of switch. All right, but on topic. So, um, so pest management. So pest management in the context of a of an ecosystem productive ecosystem garden. Uh, it's a it's kind of a, like a we have a range of tools available to us, and. It's like a hierarchy of tools. So we'd start at the top with our with our habitat creation and our um, you know our soil building, and then we'll work through a series of different tools to deal with different situations. So I'm just going to jump up onto the whiteboard now and um, try and try and write these down. So let us know if it if you can or can't see. Um, I just want to quickly run through these because we will then get to the, the, the things that you can do right away to help with your pest management. So, so the first tool um, is this biological approach. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, um, habitat creation above the ground. And I think you guys are all over this. Uh, it's all got to do with diversity and creating habitat. Can anyone remember some of the things that we talked about, how we can create habitat for, for beneficial insects and animals in the garden? Throw out a few. Just leaving stuff lying around, like log little things that drop from tree. Yep. Yeah, little hiding spots. Yep. Flowering plants, really key. And don't, don't use any or at least not any sprays or actual conventional pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, none of that stuff. Yeah, that's a really good, really good, um, yep, that's an important part of it. Well, and that, those sorts of things are sort of further down the hierarchy, so we'll, we'll definitely talk about those. What about in terms of habitat? I remember, what else have we got? Water, pond. Yeah, water, so a pond is great. Um, yeah, they're, they're some of the key things. What else have we got? Little hidey holes, plant stacking, mulch, uh, a pond, flowers. Yeah, they're all there. Um, and if you can have this sort of stuff there year round is really important. So you've got a constant home for all your good good bugs or the predators or the beneficials, um, then you're halfway there because then you've got this whole army of predators that are going to keep your pest numbers down. So that's habitat creation above the ground. Habitat creation below the ground is just as important and we talked about that um, building healthy soil a healthy soil ecosystem so you know there's some things that you can do around that um, so I guess the important things there are, are not digging 
diversity of plants constantly growing and putting carbon into the ground uh, and then compost and mulch. So you've got the decomposing elements as well. All right, so then we move on to our second range of tools, um, which you might call cultural tools. So these are the things that you do. So when you're spending time in the garden, these are the, the cultural tools, the things that you do. Um, the first thing, I don't know if you can read this if it's coming through. Um, I can't see that, Steve. Yeah, okay. So the first, probably one of the most important things um, you can do, well, to do with pest management, but to do with everything uh, is observe. So observation. And Julian, last week, um, we went through, uh, took you through a process of observing your plants and, and reading your plants and then uh, understanding what, you know, what they might need or what's going on. So that this process of observation is so underrated and it's so important. And it's just, a, I've probably mentioned it before, it's just the process of uh, enjoying your garden, spending time in it, walking around and looking. Um, so you're looking, you're just noticing things and getting to, to understand, understand your landscape. Um, so you're looking for, you know, this is, if you walk around your garden every day and, and look at your plants, you'll notice that if there's a pest species there, you'll notice how much damage it's doing. If it's doing any damage, you'll notice things as they're happening. Um, so really, really important. Um, so yeah, so the observation is, is looking for, uh, you, know, you know, the health of your plants and the health of um, any, any pests, any critters going on. Um, all right. The second, we'll call that 2A. So the second or another cultural tool that you can use uh, is building healthy soil. Hey, you know, like, that's better. Um, so I know it's been mentioned a few times, but I, I'll keep mentioning it because it's really important. So building healthy soil is something you do all the time. Um, I think last week someone asked, we were talking about uh, the citrus and what they were, we were looking at deficiencies in the plants and someone said, you know, is the best thing just to keep adding compost? I can't remember who asked that question. It was really a question. I kind of, I don't think I answered. I said, I sort of said well, I don't really know at this point. Um, I've done some research and a lot of reading and stuff over the week and thinking back over the years and, um, and I can definitely say yes, adding compost constantly is definitely the way to build healthy soil, one of the ways to build healthy soil. So compost and mulch, compost and mulch. Um, because what compost does, rather than feeding the plants, it actually, compost builds your healthy soil ecosystem. So it's like the building blocks for all the organisms to live on is compost. So it's different to feeding the plant, it's actually building soil structure and it's putting fungi and bacteria. So, so building healthy soil, if you can, um, if you can, well, start the compost bin is probably one of, is one of the best things you can do for your for your plants. Into even and it builds into pest management. Okay, so it's, it's sort of disconnected, but it's totally connected. So compost and mulch. So composting and mulching um, constantly is is one of the cultural things that you can do to manage pests. Uh, I've got a black pen now, so I might be able to read it a bit better. Um, another thing is planting. Feel free to shout out any questions on chat or even just blurt them out. That's fine. Um, all right, so planting patterns. I don't know if you remember, I think it was in the week that we did planting. Second, second week maybe about, and we planted out the veggie garden and we thought about the different things that we were planting. Can you remember what some of the, the strategies and the thinking behind plant selection and planting patterns were? Um, 
Yep, so Barb just suggested mixing plants, some with deeper roots and some of them with shorter roots. So you're sort of um, making the most of the stacking in the soil. Yep. Guilds. Um, yeah, guilds. Do you want to briefly explain what a guild is and how that works? Um, oh, oh, okay. It's, well, it, well, you were doing groups of three um, of the same plant, but mixing them mixing different types of plants together rather than the, the idea of crop rotation, which I found quite a, quite a, you know, a bit of a different em emphasis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's that mixing up different plants. So it comes back to diversity again, and then understanding which plants, what functions different plants do. So you might have tall plants that, uh, you know, your legumes that put nitrogen into the ground, you might have your leafy greens, and they all, you know, all these different groups of plants actually have different functions. And when you understand those functions, you can put them together in a group and they all help each other. So that's kind of guild planting. And one of the one of the parts of that is the is using herbs. Can you remember what we used herbs for? What was like one of the key functions of, of our herbs in our in our guild or in our group planting? The smell and the flowers. Yes, yeah, so both of those things. So the smell um, and incorporating smelly plants, we call it, uh, you could call it uh, scent masking. Uh, so insects find their food by sight and smell. So if you've got lots of different smells going on, you can actually mask the smell of the plant that they're looking for so they can't find it. So that's part of part of the guilt. So a thing called scent masking. So lots of smelly plants in the garden is really helpful. And the other one, as you mentioned, um, flowers. So if you've got flowers in there, you're attracting the good bugs that help keep the keep the pests uh, managed. Um, and the other thing with the tapestry and the planting little groups and mixing things together uh, is you might call it shape masking. So insects may find their food by the the, the shape or the texture or the colour. So if you've just got a kaleidoscope of all different textures and colours, then it's harder again for the pest to find their food. Um, so there's a, that's a few strategies around planting. Uh, what else have we got? So the other another thing that you can do, which is a really good um, strategy, is plant selection. So in terms of choosing plants that uh, grow really well in your garden or in your area and don't get pests and diseases in the first place. Um, so you could almost design this another, another strategy for minimizing damage. A really good example of that <laughs> is um, tomatoes. So, uh, you know, you want to, people love, we love eating tomatoes. Tomatoes are fantastic. Um, has anyone grown the big tomatoes, big like groslies or or those kind of ones. Um, what often happens in Sydney particularly is the fruit fly gets them. So tomatoes are actually really difficult to get to, to eat because everything wants to eat them. Fruit flies, this, that, and the other. So they were quite a high, a high need plant in terms of you needing to, to step in and do some pest management. Little cherry tomatoes, they grow like weeds and you don't have to do anything except go out and eat them. So you know, but if you want to make your life easy and minimize your pest management issues, choose the choose the easy ones, choose the little cherries as opposed to the big ones. Um, and there's a lot of examples of that, um, you know, with different plants. So some of your leafy greens are easier to grow than others. Some of your brassicas are easier to grow than others. And that, that just comes with experience and kind of asking around and, and talking. So that's your research. All right, we're back on, okay. <laughs> technical hitches there um so plant selection for, for for resilience okay really part of your cultural strategy um so there are things you do without actually you know, we haven't even gone towards um killing things all right so sometimes uh and this is the the core of today is you'll you know you'll do all this stuff and you'll have some cabbages or whatever that you really want to eat and you'll notice one day that that they've got I don't know, say so cabbage moth uh, caterpillars on them. You, so 
now you're engaged with the thinking process. Okay, you think, well, what do I do? And Bob, Bob just before had a had a comment about um, one of her native plants had a caterpillar on it, and the thinking process was for Bob, okay, what am I going to do? There's a caterpillar on my plant. Um, do you want and yeah, so Bob thought, well, you know, how many are there? Um, is it, a, I guess, is it a problem is the first, the first thing that Bob was thinking. Uh, and then what did you decide? I decided to, it was just one, so I decided to leave it. Yeah, so there was one. Um, can people, I don't need to convey that. Okay, so, so the, Bob saw only one caterpillar. It wasn't doing much damage. She decided to leave it there for the birds. So Bob knew there were birds around that would probably eat this caterpillar. But I know that this afternoon, Bob's going to go and check it out again and maybe tomorrow and just to see how that's going if, if she gets an influx of caterpillars. If you have an influx of caterpillars on your cabbages and you decide, hmm, I, as much as I love this whole ecosystem concept, my cabbages are just getting mashed. Okay, what... What what's something you can do without damaging your ecosystem? Any ideas? So if it's caterpillars, they're big enough to pick off. Yep. So I'm going to write this. I've run out of room. So squash them. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a sec. So three is. Uh, So physical uh, and or mechanical means of stepping in. So you might so pick them off. All right, it's quite easy. It's, um, you know, if you've got chickens, so this is the, the big system again, you pick a caterpillar off, feed it to your chickens. It's a resource. Your cabbages is okay. So it's, you're turning your caterpillars into eggs. Um, you could squash them. You can... You know, just throw them onto the lawn, hope something eats them. Um, you're just basically protecting that particular plant from that particular pest. Uh, what's another thing you can do if you in to protect your plant without um, yeah, without damaging the system? Netting. Yeah, netting. So nets and barriers. Well, nets are barriers, but basically barriers. So you do this before you get your caterpillars. Um, I don't have much netting, but, but basically the idea is you get something to put over your plants or plant that stops the moths from laying their eggs on the, on the, on the cabbage in the first place. So you probably wouldn't use something like this necessarily, but maybe some bird netting uh, or you can get insect netting. Uh, you can cover the whole bed, you can cover individual plants, but essentially the idea, there's lots of different ways to do that, is you're creating a barrier between the pest and your plant, so you're stopping them from even getting access to the food that you want. Um, so this is a step before the picking off because you want to stop the actual act of, of needing to pick off. Um, so this is a, an example of a fruit, could be a fruit net. So what you do if you've got... Um, this is something we use similar to what we use at my place. I've got a big avocado tree that I was lucky to inherit. And every couple of years, we, it just gets covered in avocados. And what we do when the avocados are quite small, um, I get the ladder out, anything I can reach without risking my neck. I just put a bag around the avocado, each individual avocado or two or three, close the, tie it closed and the fruit grows inside the bag and it stops in our case, it's possums. Possums love eating everything, um, but this tends this stops the possums from getting access to the to the avocado, and it also stops other bugs that are that sting it. And the fruit just grows in the bag. A few months later, we just break them off, open the bag, and pull out these beautiful, totally blemish-free, delicious avocados, and um, they're they're fantastic. So you know we're not damaging anything. The system is still functioning. Um, but we're protecting the, the things that we want. And I think a few of you guys, um, I think some of, from memory, some of the videos around pest management were 
uh, you know, something's coming at night and just eating everything. So in, in, the, in urban areas, we have things like rats and possums and uh, mice that come at nighttime and just eat everything. That's one of the biggest issues around here. Um, some sort of barrier to try and stop those guys getting in is, is a really good way to go. And it's almost the only thing you can do with possums that I've found. So, you know, it could be, could be bird netting around the perimeter of your garden. It could be a hoop. Um, yeah, so barriers are a great option. The only issue with barriers is you, they'll stop everything getting in. And because we know it's a diverse ecosystem, we've got pollinators, we've got all sorts of beneficials, you need to balance that completely blocking off to letting access to some of the time. So, and that's just something you'll, you'll learn with experience. Um, any questions about any of this stuff so far? Nope. Okay. All right. Um, oh, I'll just show you another couple more barriers. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. It's, um, yep, it's copper, essentially it's copper tape and it rolls out like sticky tape. And, it, and you stick it, um, you can use it for pots. There we go. Okay, and it, so that's actually adhesive. If you're growing plants in pots and you've got snail, um, won't say problems, but if you've got snails eating some of your seedlings, you can use this as a perimeter around your plants and the snails won't crawl over the copper. They don't like it. Um, does anyone know other solutions for little snail to protect your seedlings from snails and slugs? I've used powder before, a sort of a powder around, you know, a, a powder barrier. Yeah, that works. Um, something that they don't like to crawl across. So powder, sand, ash, flour, coffee grounds can work. So you're basically building a building a fence, a snail proof fence around individual seedlings. Whatever you use just breaks down and turns into humus. So it's, um, it's a good strategy. Um, okay, so there's different barrier options. Another thing that you can do um, is, is, is traps. So, all right, uh, let's see. so you might have, um, and Jan, Jan did this for us here in the, in the pig, um, setting up traps for, so some, there are some animals that come and eat your plants that don't seem to have any natural predators. Uh, in this case, citrus leaf miner, which is a little little moth that lays its eggs on the leaves and the little maggots um, grow around and they eat the leaf and then it goes all curly. Um, doesn't seem to be any natural predator or they just come in big numbers and whatever you do, doesn't, doesn't matter. So how do we manage those guys without, again, without damaging everything else? Um, and we're lucky because there is this trap. I think we might have showed you. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right, so this is a certified organic citrus leaf miner trap. And the way that this guy works um, is that it opens up. Actually, I'll open one up. Um, uh, oops. So it opens up, it's got inside, it's got um, sticky. Yeah, so it's a sticky trap. And it's got inside here is a little container of uh, female moth pheromone. So it attracts the male moths. You put the pheromone in there, poor guys, they go in really hopeful and they just get stuck to their um, the sticky trap and then they die. So what it does, it breaks the life cycle of the leaf miner so that they can't re reproduce and then it just reduces the numbers down for next year. Um, I think we have pretty good results here, Jan, with, with, your, with your trapping efforts. Steve, yeah. sorry, so where do you put that? Oh, sorry, and you hang it in, hang it in the tree. 
So you just hang that in the tree and it, you know, we, we've been watching them here and they haven't caught anything else. So there's no bycatch, by I guess, just the citrus leaf miner. Uh, we've still got citrus leaf miner and we still will have citrus leaf miner because they're just part of the part of the system, but these traps can minimize the damage that they do and minimize the numbers. So that just hangs in the tree like that. I'll show you one that's out there at the moment. And you can so the this is a good trap. Well, this is a very useful trap in, in managing citrus leaf miner. You can go to the hardware store or the nursery and buy these traps. What's the difference? Uh, the the wise traps are targeting just the target pest, whereas the other ones are indiscriminate. So they'll catch even the good guys. That's exactly right. That's the big difference. So if you see these ones, if you hang these in your tree, you will catch everything. So you'll catch ladybugs. Uh, I've actually seen lizards stuck on this stuff. So probably not such a good choice for your ecosystem. Whereas this one is specifically only for the, the pest that you're after. So when you're choosing, choose this one. So get this one. <laughs> All right. Um, what else have we got? If you've got another way to manage your snail and slug population, you'll see these in the, in the shops as well. It's a snail and slug trap. You, you just bury that in the ground. Um, you put some beer in there if you want to, if you want to share it. If not, you can use Vegemite and, um, and lettuce and a bit of water. It's the yeast I think that they're attracted to. Bury that in the ground. These come with a lid, it just keeps the rain off. You could also just use a can for, with stuff in it. What's, what's the downside of using these? Is there a downside to using these? The indistinct catch lizards, doesn't it? Yeah, it doesn't seem to catch other things. Some, sometimes I get full of slaters, but um, I don't know if you remember back to our, our pest, uh, a few weeks ago, our pest observation exercise where we showed the slides and we were identifying different, different critters that would come and live in the garden and some of them were pests and some of them were predators. Can anyone remember the slug version? Well, this is the leopard slug, which is actually a good thing. Yep, exactly. So this will catch leopard slugs, which are carnivores. They eat other slugs and snails. So, so it's um, it's potentially killing uh, the good bug, the whole leopard slug. Um, I think that's probably the big downside to it. The other downside is if you've got a blue tongue lizard, because you've done all this stuff with you've got a pond and, and habitat. Uh, this is snails are the blue tongue's food source. Uh, you don't want to get rid of them necessarily because the, the blue tongue will do it for you. But you know, if you've got a, a zillion slugs and snails, maybe this is something you might want to do in the short term. Um, the other other thing you can do is just go out at night when it's raining with a torch, and they're easy to catch. Snails are not that fast. I reckon you can probably get a few. Um, oh, what if you go to the shop and you see this? So you got snails, you got slugs, they're eating your seedlings, um, your barriers for whatever reason don't seem to be working. You might see some of this. What, um, what's your choice? Well, that was a dumb question. What, um, would, you, would you use these? That's probably not a great question either. <laughs> well, see where I'm going. That's also about what Jan was saying about it being indiscriminate and you, you know you leave them lying around there if you're just scattering a poison like that then you you're going to be affecting the ground around where it is lying aren't you yeah possibly depending on what you're using this one's quite interesting actually because it's 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 a um look it's almost a fertilizer this stuff so it breaks down and turns into nutrients that your plants can eat so in some context, definitely, if you're leaving chemicals lying around, not a good option. These not so much the case. Um, but in this case... I'm just, just wondering maybe to mention that, uh, just so I can... Yeah. There are two types. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh. yeah, it just might not have been completely clear. Um, a lot of the snail and slug killers are poisonous. So you're absolutely right. You can see on the front of this one, it's saying it's animal and cat, you know, it's pet friendly because it actually isn't poisonous to, to mammals. Um, but all the other ones are poisonous. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, but leopard slugs will eat these. So same problem uh, with that. And the same for the same reason, uh, you're killing you're killing lizard food and you're killing potentially leopard slugs. Um, yeah, so we can, you don't know, yeah. <laughs> you don't need those. Um, what else have we got? Okay, so we've sort of morphed a little bit into the chemical approach. So we've, we've, we've got a bit of a hierarchy here. So some of the physical things you can do, traps, nets, barriers, picking off. Um, the last thing I'll mention, in the hierarchy is chemicals. No, I won't call them chemicals. We'll call them sprays. Okay, so, um, all right, so I've got aphids on my broccoli. Uh, I go to the nursery and I say, I've got aphids on my broccoli. Chances are they'll say, here, have some of this. Give us 10 bucks and go and spray this all over your broccoli. Hopefully they'll, if they're going to choose one, they'll choose this one because this is certified organic. There are ones that are a lot worse, but even certified organic sprays, um, even homemade sprays out of chili or uh, soap or whatever, what are they designed to do? Well, I think they're going to kill my bees in my garden, as well as the other little insects. Yeah. Yeah. So they're indiscriminate. They just kill everything. Um, so if you're thinking about spraying, just keep that in mind that they, you know, for every aphid, there's probably a ladybug around the corner. And if you spray your plants, you're going to kill a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily want to kill. You spend a lot of effort trying to get this diverse ecosystem. So any spray, even organic sprays uh, are designed to kill. So for me, the thought process is, you know, do I need to kill things in order to grow things? Um, and the answer is no, you don't. So, um, but yeah, if you go, if you go to a nursery or hardware store and you see a spray and it's not certified organic, I would highly recommend not going there because like, um, well, let's think. So if you spray anything onto your leaves, apart from killing your ladybugs and your hoverfly larvae and uh, all the other good guys, as well as the pests, what happens when it rains? Goes into the soil. Yeah, it goes into the soil. What do you think this stuff does to your soil ecosystem? It'll kill a bacteria. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we don't really know, but chances are it's gonna kill stuff, okay? Um, so yeah, I, I would recommend, I'll put the challenge out to you guys, um, just take sprays out of your toolbox because they, they were literally just they're designed to kill stuff and we, uh, we take a different approach. We, we prefer to actually create life rather than killing things as organic you know, as an ecosystem model. So um, I haven't sprayed for probably 20 years and I don't intend to. So you don't really need to. There's a lot of, the, spend your time up here. Spend your time at the top of the hierarchy. Put the chemicals last, if at all. Okay, so yeah, I guess just to summarize, there's a whole kind of world of things that you can do that can manage the pests and so that make sure that you get a really good feed out of your garden, but don't, um, that, that actually build a healthy ecosystem. So there's lots and lots of other positive spin-offs apart from the food that you get. Um, you know, you, you sequestering carbon in the ground, you get more nutrient rich uh, food, your yields will be higher. Um, if you follow this method, like the singing frogs guys, you'll get enormous yields um, and you won't be wasting your time running around trying to kill stuff. You'll actually enjoy the garden and, and the space that you're creating. So 
I think it's time uh, to do a breakout, breakout rooms. So the, I think today, rather than a specific question, I'd like you guys to um, just have a, just each person to share one of the pests or one of the issues that they're having, that you're having in your garden around pests. And just as a group for each person, see if you can use this kind of hierarchical thinking, use your different tools to, to come up with a solution for, for managing that particular pest for that particular person. And then once we get back together in, in the broader group, uh, if we'll get each group just to share one, one of their issues and how you guys think you might resolve that, that pest problem. Does that, um, does that make sense? So you have six minutes. So it'll be quick, um, but that's good. There's only two or three in each room. Okay, so there's only two or three in each room. That's so that works well. So, yep. All right. So let's see if you can come up with some solutions for each other using this model. And ready? Yep. Nearly there. Any questions? You're in. Cool. Pause recording. Hello. Oh, okay. That was the... <laughs> Hello. All right. Are we back? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so we've just realized We've got about 10 minutes to go. Um, we really, I'm really keen to hear what you guys have talked about and what you came up with for, for various things. Um, yeah. We did want to go out into the garden and just have a look at some of the plants out there and have a think about some of the strategies that we use out there in the context of the, the different tools. Um, uh, so we asked now, if, if, you, you know, if you guys wanted to stay longer, we're happy to go longer. If not, that's totally fine as well. So i um, just want to put that out there now. We may, um, yeah. So who wants to go first? We need one of the groups to tell us, uh, yeah, what you talked about and what strategies you came up with. With somebody from Amanda and Helen's group. Amanda! <laughs> Helen, do you want to talk? No, you go. Okay. Um, sorry, I came a bit late into the program today because I was having internet issues. So I missed your first mm. half. But um, having said that, Helen helped me catch up. Um, so Helen was talking about maybe getting one of the leaf miner chaps for her citrus as a strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, and also I was talking about how I've noticed my rocket, which is right on the ground, has been eaten a lot more in the last week or something. And so Helen suggested I go out at night time and just observe what it is. Um, yep. You know, so I, I've got some leaves that are still going and they seem to be like the older leaves. And I thought, oh, maybe they don't like the more bitter, older rocket leaves. They like the younger mm -hmm newer shoots um, but I just noticed a lot more kind of eaten recently so I thought mm, I better go out maybe have a look at night time yeah uh-huh <laughs> yep sounds good uh, sounds good so you can catch them in the act yes all right thank you somebody from Jan Leslie Ann or James group Uh, Jane, do you want to talk about since it was your situation? While they're figuring that, Lisa and Nikki will be next. And if you can... Oh, so Jan, uh, yeah, well, Jan just had some great ideas. I was trying to think about the application of some of these principles. Uh, I'm a member of a community garden, but um, otherwise I have a balcony. So trying to think about things I could do on my balcony. And Jan had some great ideas about the um, uh, the types of mulch in particular. Uh, if you want to go, Jan? Look, as I said, I, I, 
I'm not saying I'm expert, but this is what I learned. And Steve and Julian would know basically whether it's true or not. I was just suggesting based on what my learning that in terms of selection of mulch, the coarser wood chip bark type in general is more better suited for the landscape or large open areas and the finer sugarcane mulch or lucerne is in general better suited for pots or small garden beds for various reasons which we don't have time to go into but it was just my suggestion but you know you are the arbiter i'm happy with that suggestion jan that's a really good one <laughs> yeah it's true yeah yeah, so and that, and that comes down to that um, soil building, doesn't it? So the different mulches have different characteristics, and they they have different impacts on the soil ecosystem. Um, and maybe we can we can explore mulch in more detail in another another session. But yep, definitely a good strategy to mix up your mulches. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Nikki. Nikki. Lisa, go, but you need to unmute yourself. Okay, thanks, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, Nikki was saying she had a problem with possums in her magnolia, so she used plastic bags and that seemed to work. So that could be a strategy for me and my uh, avocado tree, which is being stripped by crows, but some kind of bird, carol wongs, I'm not sure. Um, it's not gonna work, it's just too high. Um, so she suggested a scarecrow, but I'd have to sort of throw it up there. So basically, I just, I've just accepted the birds can have the avocados and hopefully they're coming in the garden and, you know, being predators for other things as well. So I just yep. am resigned to not getting much fruit. <laughs> oh, that seems so sad. <laughs> but yeah, look, some... they can have it. It's not the end of the world. Um, I, I get a few, a very few that they miss, but um, yeah, they just love them. Yeah, are they just too high to? Uh, yeah, to have to, you know, it's 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 at a block of apartments. I'd have to get a ladder out. It's not. Yeah, I, I'm just not yeah. going to go there. Yeah. Okay. And I'm interested in the plastic bags. How do you use those? In what? Um, you, you you tie them so they're just ordinary supermarket white supermarket plastic bags and you tie them in the trees and then at night when the wind blows they fill up with air and they sort of move around and they crackle and it, it's it really worked my magnolia never looked better than when i had some plastic bags in the trees so it's just a something i learned along the way yeah cool that's really good um yeah, I guess that's a whole other, whole other group of things. Scary things is not something we talked about. So yeah, scarecrows. Scarecrows, not so sure. I think they work for about a day or two until the uh, animals realize that they're just an inanimate object. But um, yeah, things that move. So yeah, that's another strategy thing. You know, some people hang CDs in trees and they spin around and um, yeah, other decoys. Cool. All right. Well, should we? Are you? How do we work this? Do you? Um, so we do a sign off, and then whoever wants to stay, then we'll go outside, or that might be the way to go. Or do we show of hands? Or? Yeah. Is there anybody that isn't able to stay on for ten more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's a few. Okay. So we'll sign yeah. off and then. Okay. Okay, um, so thanks for thanks for coming along for this pest management um, tools workshop. Um, if we could, in the next couple of minutes, uh, if we'll go, we'll just go around again, one at one person at a time, and just share something that you remember from the workshop. It just helps everyone kind of pull it all together. Uh, so maybe Julian can facilitate um, turning your microphones on or un unmuting you in an organised fashion so you can, um, everyone can have a go. Well, Jean, would you mind starting? I have used the eco oil and I never will again. <laughs> <laughs> I love ladybirds. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of music to my ears, really, but yeah. No, that's cool. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, nice one. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda. Yeah, I think um, the observing, like going out and observing, you know, actually what the pests are, because I, th I realize I'm doing a lot of kind of guesswork, you know, just, oh yeah, maybe that's slugs or something, but actually maybe it's not. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's actually rats. Maybe they actually like rocket. So yeah, yeah I have to have a look. Yeah, Thanks. Great. Thank you. And then Helen? Yeah, no, no. Um, so Amanda and I did talk about observation and how difficult it is because you, you just want, you know, like you just want to wave your hands and do a magic pill. So it's, um, it is a thing to, to try and observe. It's a really good thing to observe. And I'll, just on the technical thing too, um, I've had two um, sessions open for this and I think just using the meeting ID helped me. On the technical side. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. You 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 fantastic. Both of yeah. you. All of you. Oh yeah. Look, just a great kind of reminder that uh, the fact that something is labeled eco doesn't actually uh, trickle down to eco benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, sorry. Just with the worms, I've been feeding them every week. I think there's eating a little bit less I th that would make sense is that right at this time of year yeah in winter they slow down they slow down cooler. okay so yeah. I've, I've maybe I've sort of just, maybe just feeding them. being aware of time Helen yep okay right. yeah if, so. if you want to hang on hang on after the session Helen yep. I'd great. like to chat worms so. great now the list rearranged itself oh dear okay Leslie Ann um <clears throat> I just continue to learn so much from your session so thank you very much but today I guess the thing that's affecting my one of my plants the most is the leaf miner on my citrus and I didn't know about the leaf miner trap that was so eco-friendly and so I'm definitely going to investigate that so thank you cool thanks Lisa Lisa um I, I'm this is like weight watchers I'm going to give up the, these the snail <laughs> I use the iron ones, but I, I guess the, the snails just decimate my plants, but I'll just try and go out at night and pick, you know, get pick, pick them off rather than use the pellet. Sure. Thank you. And I think I'm, I'm starting to learn that we shouldn't try and make our gardens something that they're not. So we kind of need to tune into the soil and the um, climate, I suppose, and, and all of that. And so if we're planting, um, the plant selection will help, you know, so I guess what I'm thinking is if, if we are trying to grow things that aren't appropriate, then we're looking for more trouble. I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Nikki. Did I miss anybody? Bob? <laughs> Don't have to. Um, the avocado bags, and I'm going to spray my soap spray. Okay. <laughs> so Bob's going to use avocado bags and uh, throw her soap spray away. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. I guess just to wrap it up, look, it's really it's interesting that I love that uh, the Weight Watchers comment, but. Um, for me, the important thing for you is is that you guys kind of understand the why and the bigger picture of of those decisions. Um, yeah, and and pest management. Yeah, is there's there's consequences to using certain techniques, um, and and different consequences to using other techniques. So I guess you can think about you know managing pests in the in the holistic context of the whole garden, the whole ecosystem. Uh, then you're halfway there. So, thanks, guys. So, for, for all those that need to leave, um, hope you'll join us for next week. We're going to be going to the Randwick Recycling Centre. Yeah. So, you can finally figure out what can and can't go into the red, yellow, and blue bin. But also, more importantly, all the things that you can take to the recycling centre. Because there's a lot of things that you can't put in the bins that can be taken to the recycling centre. Um, 
So yeah, please join us for that. Let people know. And um, for everybody else, we're going to head out into the garden. Now. So are, are we staying on, or are we if, signing? If you, if if you want to stay on, we're just going to just have a bit of time in the garden, maybe only five or ten minutes, just to have a look at at um, at this stuff in the context of what we're doing here. Uh, uh, we'll have a look at a citrus and we'll have a look at our veggie garden. So you're welcome to join us, but no pressure. <laughs> Steve, um, while we're walking, yes. um, I know that mosquitoes aren't kind of used to but I don't think they are. But do you have any ideas about how to control mosquitoes? Um, it's hard. I think they like shady, sort of dark areas. Yeah. Um, probably the best thing you can actually do is make sure there's no uh, standing water, like any water standing around. Like, uh, you know, they'll breed in even in the bottom dish of your pot plants. If you've got any still water lying around, they'll, that's when you can have problems. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's hard because it might be in, in your neighbor's house, so you could just be in a in an ecosystem that's really mozzie friendly. So it's a bit tricky. There are tree, there are plants you can buy that sort of claim claim that they repel. But um, I don't think they actually do. Unless you're kind of okay. picking them and rubbing them. Or, you know, right. yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, something's frozen. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Something's frozen. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Someone. She froze. To be much new growth, but uh, in springtime we'll see lots of shoots coming through. So you'll be looking at the the vigor and the health of the shoots. Um, you know the color of the older leaves, the color of the newer leaves, um, the wrinkly leaves. Um, so you're just getting a feel for the health of the plant. I'll be looking up. Is there any fruit? There's quite a bit of fruit on the out outlying branches. Um, you know, so there's a fair bit of pests. Um, stuff going on here but we've got our this is the leaf miner trap get in there so you might be able to see inside there there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, a whole bunch of those little little insects they're the they're the citrus leaf miner they're the adults so we've caught quite a few so hopefully next year or next time that we get the new growth when the when the pests are active and eating the new growth, so there won't be so many next year. So I'm not too concerned about any of this stuff. This is just normal citrus behavior. Um, we've got lots of fruit and it, the fruit looks fine. So, um, so for, for me, my interpretation of this is uh, it's fruiting, it's growing. Generally, the vigor is okay. Uh, I'm not worried about it. We could probably do with a bit of a prune and maybe we could do a citrus pruning workshop at some stage just to open up in the middle. What I'm also looking for is what's going on around the citrus. So we've got, um, you know, we've got some lavender growing here, which is good to get the um, pollinators. So we get more fruit. So there's lavender. Uh, we've got some chick chickweed here, which is a, is a weed, but it's edible. And it's just naturalizing here, so we, we just let it go. It's it's putting carbon into the soil. We've got a fruit that's fallen here. We do have probably one of our biggest pests in this garden is um, humans. And they tend to do stuff that we don't necessarily, it's not great for the garden. 
But um, so that's. Would you leave it? Uh, no, we'll take that away. So we got some pass, some parsley growing here. Um, we've got sweet potato with the soil. Let's have a quick, so I'd have a bit of an inspection of the soil. Oops. Um, I don't know if you can see that white stuff. Yeah. That fungi, so we've got tons of fungi, dark, rich, plenty of fungus going on here. Beautiful humus. So the soil is quite good. Could probably do with more mulch. There's a worm. There we go. You might have a dig around. The soil looks really good. So I don't think we need to worry about that. Maybe we could think about adding some more composted mulch, maybe later in the year, just before spring, uh, when things start to grow. So we've got lots of diversity. We've got lots of ground. Well, some ground cover we can do with more ground cover. We've got some some bits of the ground that don't have plants on them, kind of paths. But um, so it's all this thinking. We've got a plant here which is called pineapple sage, which is a smelly, fragrant thing. So that helps with our scent masking. So we've got some fragrant, and so does the lavender. Actually, we've got some good scent masking plants going on. Um, so generally pretty good. We could probably just do with some more compost and mulch, like I said, some stage later, and just keeping an eye on those citrus leaf miner traps and make sure that they're we might refresh them in a, in, in spring. So that's that's yeah. Um, we'll have a look at our raised beds. Or are we done? Are we done? That'll probably do it. So you get the idea. It's not rocket science. It's just um, it's just reading your landscape and and looking at all of those things that we talked about just regularly and thinking, okay, maybe we need a bit of this. Maybe we need a bit of I don't know, more ground covers. Maybe we need some more plants that are going to, to put more carbon into the into the soil. Um, yeah. So it's it's bigger picture thinking than just looking at the specific actual test or the, the problem so you're looking at the whole system i think we'll leave it there so thanks guys thanks very much steve and um okay, thanks no very much Stephen. have a good week thank you thank you Pleasure. okay and helen did you want to look at the worms or talk worms <laughs>